Welcome to So What's It Actually About? I'm your host, Margie McKechnie, and I, along with my wide array of guests, hope to help you better understand and weather the wonderful world of actuarial science. Hello, and welcome to today's episode. We are joined by Rob. Rob, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Boggy. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Standard question we always start the podcast with. Can you tell us a bit about your current role and sort of how you got there? Sure. I guess it's... See, no, <laughs> the <problem laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. We, we, you will begin. Tell us about yourself. Yeah. Like, perfect interview question. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm Rob Attle. I'm the CEO of Discovery Insure. I've been in the role for eight months now. Um, and it's it's been an incredible journey. So, I mean, maybe just to give you a sense, I started my career 11 years ago. Okay. Um, started in Discovery Life as a as a valuations actuary. Sure. Okay. So, so really technical, is that. technical purist route, um, which was an incredible foundation. Yeah. Like, absolutely yeah. loved my role, um, my role there. And I mean, over time, we saw the need for for really an, an analytics function at Discovery Life. Mm-hmm. So um, then I started uh, leading the analytics team, kind of a newly found yeah. team at Discovery Life, mm-hmm. uh, which I also loved. I mean, at Discovery, yeah. I mean, not to go too much about product, but I mean, it's like a place where data yeah. is kind of a yeah. complete mecca. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, it's amazing. Across various various product houses as well. Exactly. Um, and and that, um, that was really amazing, right? To yeah. look at kind of mortality, morbidity stats. I mean, everything that you learn in varsity, yes, um, where the CMEC come to life. I mean, excuse me, we're doing your life. <laughs> we're speaking about mortality tables, <laughs> but literally coming to life. And, and just really seeing how kind of all that theory kind of plays out over time um, and really learning from some of the best minds in the mm. industry i mean mm. um it's just when you work with other actuaries it's like so fulfilling because yes. you know that kind of everyone together is smarter than any individual yes um, and that's really the powerful thing of working with incredible teams yeah um so kind of post that i got the opportunity to move to discover insure okay and um, to head up the corporate actuarial team and why sorry to stop you there but why the move did you want that was it like a new challenge or was it just there was an opportunity and you decided you were going to go for it yeah it was actually just more of a first challenge okay uh, the ceo at the time reached out said there was an opportunity to work quite closely with him um some of the skills were very, very transferable yes. in terms of kind of SAM framework, but the one, mm-hmm. the two, gotcha. um, and then there was kind of the enjoyment of things that are really specific around short-term insurance, yes. um, which I thought was going to be quite interesting, and it, yes. it ended up being really interesting. Yeah, um, kind of everything from those um, uh, those Randolph triangles, yes. the BF method, like everything yes. you learn yes. again, like plays out in reality in a short-term insurance yeah. space. Yeah, um, which you wouldn't have seen really in the life space at all. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I really enjoyed about kind of the short-term role is even though it was a short-term insurer, we still really did EV modeling. We still use profit yes. like software. Yes. So there was this yes. real traditional life element to it okay. and that we used in this business quite strategically. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of there was that and it also had a, quite a big component of reinsurance negotiations of course. Okay. Okay. Yes. So that was like a completely different side of the business that you got exposure to. Exactly. And in the short term space, reinsurance um, is kind of um, actively managed in the sense that it changes every year. So yes. Instead of yes, because you renegotiate exactly. periodically. So instead of kind of long term cohorts of contracts, you have these annual contracts to cover you for catastrophes. Yes. Um, and it's kind of a, a very dynamic market. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where you engage a lot with reinsurers. I mean, I really enjoy that part of my 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 job. Okay. Um, so. So technical, but also fairly rela- relational. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the time, I guess my manager said, well, if you can negotiate with a reinsurer, surely you should be able to negotiate like wider contracts, Okay, um, which was quite interesting. So then at the time, the procurement area moved into kind of the actuarial okay. space. Now, procurement okay. in the short-term business is really the underbelly of all the agreements um, from how we pay tow trucks to how we pay panel beaters to how we pay oh, deep is that's like a whole car rental exactly okay um but really it drives the cost of a short-term insurer yeah. uh, because of those those agreements are kind of very strong and, and really well negotiated and um, that's really where you save a lot of money yeah yeah because um, it controls that one aspect of pricing right exactly you can't do the frequency so much but the cost you can that's yeah exactly yeah it. Um, so my role really extended into like a really non-actuarial role. Okay. Um, but still while I was doing the corporate actuarial things on the side. So I was oh, okay. doing Sorry. kind of capital work, <laughs> actuarial work, um, and then at the same time negotiating with car rental companies okay. on the best rate per day we can get and like generating volume deals for the business. Um, and then 
at the time the CEO decided to to move abroad, mm -hmm. um, and and I ended up being given the opportunity to okay. to lead this incredible business, and that is where I am today. Sure, sure. I mean, that's quite <laughs> a dynamic part there. I'm actually going to backtrack you to like the beginning of the whole journey. Sure. Why Trail Science? Like, I'm sure there were numerous things that you could have done. Yeah. What drew you to that? Um, and what, what you expected it to be? Sure. And I'm sure you've probably asked this question many times on the no. podcast and I've listened to a few <laughs> responses and I, my response is unfortunately going to be fairly boring in the mm -hmm. sense of it's the, the really typical journey of you do a trick, you're really good at maths. Yeah, they're like, go to actuarial science. it's kind of one of your main options. And yeah. I was at the time really considering actuarial science. I was considering forensic accounting, which okay. I think kind of a CA role with an LLB degree. So okay. essentially it's being able to kind of identify financial irregularities and um, but then end up kind of prosecuting and understanding the legal background behind sure. it as well. Okay. So okay. kind of fairly niche, yeah. niche. Um or medicine was kind of okay. the options okay. I looked at. Um job shadowed medicine definitely wasn't for <laughs> not me. Not couldn't stomach a, a sandwich <laughs> after being in the theater. <laughs> Fair enough. Um and yeah, so I mean I just went on this journey of actual science and, mm -hmm. and mostly because I looked at the degree and I saw the courses that were covered. And yes. I saw there was maths which I loved. Yes. Um and then I saw things like economics and things that were really relevant, just what I thought would kind of be valuable in a business environment. Yes. yes. Um that's it, I had no idea that it would involve the mortality tables that it did. Yes. And kind of yes. the, the pure actuarial work. Yeah. Um but I ended up really enjoying it. Okay. Um, and I didn't kind of I didn't mind, and I knew it was a really good foundation wherever I ended up mm -hmm. um, kind of wanting to go. And were there any sort of struggles that you had during your studying sort of journey? Was there any time when you were like, oh, no, this is not for me. Maybe I should have done the forensic accounting. <laughs> <laughs> like, like what, what was that kind of period of your, of your life like? Yeah, I mean, I think that definitely, I mean, I hope it happens to everyone when they go through actual science, yeah. but you probably come from an environment where, um, like, you were, like one of the top performers in the area you were in, you move into actual science and suddenly you're in the room with with all the top performers from their various schools, right? Yes. Um, and suddenly yes. you realize, cool, this is this is really gonna level up. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I'm gonna have to bring it. And it isn't gonna be with the money. Literally <laughs> But this isn't just going to be about like relying on talent or yeah. just working hard. You're going to have yeah. to you're going to have to bring both. Mm. Um, so yeah, definitely like being surrounded by incredibly strong people. Yes. Um, sometimes it makes you, makes you question whether you're kind of the right right fit in the room. Yes. Yes. Um, or if you have something to add. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you end up finding your space, and you end up realizing over the four years of studying, um, including honors. That like everyone has a niche and everyone has a strength, mm. um, and maybe people who are very strong at CT one in, in first year yes. um, end up struggling maybe with more of the written skills yes. in honors, yeah. for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think over time you realize that like you, you're good at certain things and you should you should build on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there were definitely moments. I mean, I don't want to call out too many stuff. I guess like stats too. <laughs> and it's that's your test on the back. Um, we'll, 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 so we'll, 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 from that. Exactly. <laughs> uh, in moments we were like, oh, maybe I should have just done something a bit simpler. Yeah. Um, but it, all of it is character building. Yeah. Um, and I think it like, builds resilience for when yeah. you enter whatever career you end up choosing. Yeah. Um, so I don't regret kind of any of the tough moments. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, you spoke to that you had lots of different interests going into to first year, sort of medicine and the forensic accounting. And I think that's played out in your career in that you have moved in lots of different spaces. How did you go about when you did move into these different roles, sort of upskilling yourself? to the level you need it to be. I mean, in the procurement space, actuarial science does not help you in that space. I wouldn't have thought, but correct me if I'm wrong. How did you go about that? No, sure. I mean, yeah, there's no CT. It's a CT, CT nine. I mean, we're here with A10. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's a really good question. So I, I think throughout my career, what I've always tried to do is identify where I, I, I lack any knowledge yeah. and I try to upskill. So yeah. like an example, very practical, would be when I was in the life valuation space, suddenly the tax environment becomes really, really complex with yes. multiple tax funds. Yes. And I realized that's a real gap in my knowledge. So yes. um, what I did was I decided to do like an H dip in tax. Um, oh, and really okay. just kind of kind of using any external resources to, to build my own knowledge. Yes. Um, and that's really been like quite a theme in my career. Mm -hmm. um, so when it was kind of when I needed to like 
grow into a leadership role. Yes. When I had the opportunity to go to London Business School yes. um, on an executive leadership course to make sure Amazing. that you really like level up. Yes. Um, and, and also engage with people, try leverage their, their networks and their understanding. Exactly. And, and really tackle any blind spots. Yes. But throughout my career, you can always tap into kind of those core skills of actuarial science. Yes. Like a V lookup is going to be useful in whatever role you're in. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the most valuable things I have ever learned. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, I think it's it's really an active learning journey. Yeah. Um, and for me, it wasn't a learning journey of of doing things that are just for my CV. It was always choosing things sure. that I think would, would that I thought would be powerful for the role that I was in. Yes, um, and not necessarily limiting yourself to this is what an actuary does. Saying okay, I have a core set of skills, and an actuary can apply those. Exactly. Given external input, etc. Yeah. So I've never really. Uh, I mean. Even my actuarial studies, I mean, I did my fellowship in healthcare, actually. Oh, really? And I was a life valuations actuary. And now you were a <laughs> And I mean, I mean, that's probably one of the crippling fears when you're in university is deciding yes. which SDs to take and which fellowship yes. to write. Yes. Um, my students are always like, and then I'm going to end up in this thing forever. <laughs> exactly. And I, yeah. you know, initially, I was fairly obsessed about it, um, about kind of what to choose. Mm-hmm. But it ended up really like being quite foundational in terms of a springboard yes. of where you end up going. And yes. I think if you've got an attitude of wanting to learn, um, it, it doesn't define your career in any yeah. way. Yeah. But someone actually just said to me, well, you can just you can read the fellowship notes of the industry that you work in. Yeah. Like you don't have to have written the exam. Yes. Um, yes. To, to get that stamp of approval that exactly. you understand. Yeah. yeah. So first yeah. kind of do, like do the fellowship in what kind of interests you and where you want to land. Um, but if you do change direction, that's perfectly fine as well. And I'm sure also some of the principles from the healthcare fellowship would have helped you in the short term space. Because there are some, some sort of similarities, albeit that there's a different claim event, <laughs> but it's, it's, it, there are some similarities in the claims of frequency. No, exactly. Different and I think if anything, it helps you apply maybe thinking of a different industry yes. um, in the industry that you work in. So yeah. I think there's kind of nothing lost yeah. um, by changing direction. Yeah, I agree. I agree. As, something that I really want to tap into is the role of an actuary in leadership roles because I think a lot of my students say to me you know in becoming an actuary does that mean I can never be entrepreneurial I can never start a business I can never be um, an exec because I think often uh, leaders of companies are associated with CAs sure. more than anything else and I think part of that is because there's more CAs <laughs> but but what do you think is the skill set that an actuary can bring to leadership and why do you think it's important that actuaries do play out in that space Sure. I mean, I think there are a few things that play into that. The first is that there's always maybe the perception that actuaries are introverts. Yes. And then there's the same kind of misconception that leaders need to be extroverts. Yes. Right. Yes. And I think it's important to to really debug both of those myths. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I don't believe you're an introvert. No. <laughs> um, so, I think there are many actuaries that are introverts, are extroverts and introverts. Yeah. Um, but importantly, in terms of leadership roles, I don't believe it's it's about how, how loud you are in a room. No. It's about how influential you are in a business. Yes. Um, and yeah. it's, it's about the impact you can make and how you can work with people to get to a common goal. Yeah. And you don't have to be an extrovert to be able to do that very well. I think an issue that happens in many people's careers is an actuary typically would start in a technical role. Yes. Um, and how corporate generally works is if you go to a technical role, you end up getting promoted to a team leader yes. or the next leadership role. Yes. And you're not really at that point equipped to lead a team, right? Yes. Just because you were good at something technical doesn't mean you're good at leading people. And you're saying completely um, different ballparks. And that's like a really critical moment in your career where yes. you should say, like, what are my strengths in terms of leading people? Do I want to lead people? Yes. Um, and if you do, like, you should invest in those skills. Yes. Um, and, and many companies have programs that invest in leadership skills. Yes. Um, and if not, there's excellent resources externally yeah. um, where you can build in your leadership skills. And was that something that you sort of set in your mind that you wanted to play a leadership role in the business? Yes. I mean, that's always really been part of maybe some of my long-term aspirations. Got you. Um, was leading people. Um, and then I guess ultimately to lead a business was, okay. was the ultimate goal. And having been in that role now for eight months, what have been some of the challenges that you've encountered um, sort of having to take on that responsibility? Yeah, so I mean, I think through any leadership change, there like there are some kind of teething issues that come yeah. out, um, which which really weren't unexpected. Mm. Um, the nice thing about a business, uh, really, as big as the one that that I'm in now, is that it, it doesn't break overnight. Yes, um, and it's it's built by incredible people. Yes, um, so a business is so much bigger than than the CEO. Yes, um, yes, it's kind of built by the thousand people that are in it. Um, so. 
I think it goes through a season of of really engaging with your staff, building trust, mm -hmm. um, and then rethinking like what is your what does your leadership team look like? What does your yes. team look like? Yes, um, and making sure that you really make kind of your step in terms of how how you lead the business. Mm -hmm. I'm sure.